So I just added in the, the Miniswan slide here because I was talking to someone maybe about an hour ago and they hadn't heard of Miniswan. And um, I think I'm still a little sad about what happened on Tuesday and so I think maybe talking about Miniswan briefly will uh, be cathartic. Um, so, so what Miniswan is, is if you're not familiar, is uh, like that's a rendering of Matt's. Uh, Matt said he created the Ruby language to make developers happy. And, uh, and so that turned into this, like, this happy feeling in our community. And like, back in the early days on the, on the uh, email lists before like, forums and stuff, if someone was kind of getting out in line and being a turd, people would be like, hey, hey, Miniswan, Miniswan. And like, what Miniswan means is, Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. And it's just this, you know, I, I feel this is one of our best tenants of our community. And uh, like my, my local Ruby group, we make these uh, Miniswan stickers. And so if you want one, come up after. I'd love to give you one. But um, you know, today I'm going to be talking about Ruby, red pandas, and you. I <laughs> I, I misjudged how many people were going to be here. So um, um, I really like this community. Like uh, I'm Sean, by the way. Uh, I love this community, this Ruby community, uh, and I love RubyConf. It's probably my favorite conference. Um, like it's hard to believe that it's been a year since San Antonio. I, like I feel it just happened, and. Uh, and it, you know, it's had me reflecting on uh, it's had me reflecting on what's happened in the past year since last November, last RubyConf, and you know, I guess obviously the thing that jumps to my mind, the big thing in the last year, is that you know we've had the we had an election, we have a new uh, new world leader, someone uh, someone who's out there, you know, uh, representing all that's best about us and what a country can be, like someone I'm personally very very proud we elected. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm talking about Justin Trudeau in Canada. Um, so, um, so a lot of people ask me about this picture, and you know, being from Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, the reason I'm so happy here in this picture is I, you know, being from Saskatchewan, it's my life goal to capture a Sasquatch, and I, th I thought I had captured the rarest of all Sasquatches, you know, the albino Sasquatch. But it turns out it was just a Yeti, so. Um, so about me, I'm, uh, I'm Sean. I, I'm the creator, organizer of Ruby for Good. Love dogs, uh, figuratively. Uh, I'm Canadian. Uh, work for the government. Um, and I'm not a big fan of public speaking. But like my wife gave me some really good advice. She said, you know, Sean, don't worry. You're gonna be fine. Just go go up there, be your regular charming and handsome self. And yeah, see, I was thinking the exact same thing. Um, <laughs> so, so um, uh, today I'm gonna to talk. Uh, like, I'm gonna talk a little bit about bees because a lot of people know me as the bee person. And I'm gonna talk about red pandas, how I solved this red panda problem, and I'm gonna hopefully inspire some of you guys to get involved in a similar thing. So. If you're not familiar with the bee thing, uh, I was helping this professor who's studying colony collapse disorder, monitor beehives using Ruby and Raspberry Pis, and he was hoping to get information on a beehive before it collapsed. Um, unfortunately, we, we weren't able to, uh, none of the beehives collapsed while we were monitoring them, so, uh, like, which seems good for the bees. And I, you know, I told him, well, we should just monitor every beehive in the world, and then none will collapse. But, uh, <laughs> He's from Columbia, and maybe it didn't translate right. He just said, no, no, that won't work. <laughs> um, but the bees are in trouble. They've just, we've eight species just moved to the endangered species list. And so it would seem like that all this bee stuff is a failure. But I think, um, I think there's some good that's happened. Uh, I want to introduce you all to Taylor. This is Taylor when I met her. Uh, this is, she was in the ninth grade. And uh, um, I took her for a tour around George Mason University. And, and showed her around, and then she just got inspired. She, uh, she went back to her high school and her parents, and she, she got a beehive, and now she has nine beehives, and she's leading in clubs, and um, how awesome that is. Uh, she just got, a, just got a $2,500 grant to you know, spread research. It's just amazing. And like, I know this because Taylor's mom got in contact with me and, and told me that, uh, uh, you know, that, that all this is happening, and she's applying to colleges, and she's writing about this, and, and that this was in, like all this beast that was an in inspiration for her. So I really think that uh, you know maybe while the project was a failure, that uh, you know this this amazing young woman is going to uh, uh, 
you know, maybe solve the problem for the future. So I'm very optimistic. But I know everyone here, don't, they don't, you guys don't care about the bees. You're waiting to see cute little pictures of red pandas. So let's, uh, let's talk about red pandas. Um, I got introduced to, well, we've all seen pictures, but uh, my first introduction to them was really when I read this article from New York Times. I was reading this article, it was telling me about what's going on, and it turned out that um, the lady who was all featured in this article and all the, all the pictures and this researcher, she works at George Mason University where I worked. And so, you know, I went and found her. Her name is Elizabeth Freeman. And, uh, you know, I asked her, hey, how can I help with your research? Because, you know, like, really, I'm thinking in my head, I want to go see a red panda. And, uh, <laughs> well, no, I want to go steal a red panda. But, um, <laughs> and so, so we got talking, and she told me a lot of really neat things about red pandas. So I'm going to share a few of them with you now. Um, but, the most important thing, if you only take one thing away from this talk about red pandas, know this, they're delicious. Okay, <laughs> obviously it's a joke. Um, so what is a red panda? Um, hmm. So this is not a red panda, this is a giant panda, but red pandas are actually the original panda. They are, uh, uh, they were discovered, I guess discovered, I don't know if that's the right word, 50 years before uh, the giant red pandas. And, um, uh, and they're not related to them at all. <clears throat> they're not related to bears. They're distantly related to raccoons and weasels and, uh, and skunks. But they broke out on their own branch about 29 million years ago. And uh, they're actually, something that's interesting about them, they're carnivores. They're not, uh, even though they eat bamboo and they've, they've, uh, they've uh, evolved to eat bamboo, they are still carnivores. And they, they uh, what? my slide's wrong. Um, sorry. And they're, they're found throughout, uh, in the Himalayas region. They're in, uh, you know, Nepal, um, uh, China, Sichuan, Yunnan, Bhutan, and uh, <clears throat> and and there's two subspecies of them, <clears throat> and and like, like I said, like they are uh, they, they are carnivores, and they live in this uh, really uh, really unique uh, area. They're about 2,000 to 5,000 meters, and if you're I guess American, multiply that by about 3.25 to get feet. They, uh, you know, they live on these slopes. They, they primarily eat, they primarily eat bamboo, but they, they, like they said, they are carnivores, so they'll eat, uh, they'll eat uh, animals if they can. They'll eat birds. They'll eat insects. Awesome. And and they're just so cute. <laughs> um, and, 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 and like I said, uh, they have this really slow metabolism, and like they have the, uh, the inside of a, of a carnivore, so what that means is like they have the single pouch stomach, they have the really short colon, and, uh, and you know, the big teeth, and, uh, and, and they have like a large range that they inhabit, because like they can only eat those bamboo shoots, and so they, they kind of like little farm areas of bamboo all over the place. Uh, but one of the problems with them, like compared to other uh, animals and carnivores their size, they, uh, they're really slow to mature like, uh, sexually. Like, it's about twice as long. They, um, their gestation periods are about twice as, as long as well, like between 90 and 160 days. And, um, <clears throat> and they, they have a very small uh, uh, litter of cubs. And, and they, they suspect that some of the reasons why they... Uh, uh, like their gestation period is so long, is be it's because their their metabolism, possibly uh, like de delayed uh, implantation or you know embryonic dive pause. And like officially, they're listed as endangered. Uh, about fifty percent of the population is in decline, um, or they've had a fifty percent po population decline in the last uh, three generations. And and this is this is a, a consistent trend. Like it's it's not uh, reversing. Um, and the total, total, the total population in the world is less than 10,000, they suspect. And in captivity, there's between about eight and 900. And, and basically, like humans, like we're, we're the reason they are, uh, they're disappearing. Like they're either being poached or like 
Um, like the people who live in these areas are like they're they're getting by on on very little. Like like it's they're very extreme areas, so they're cutting down the forest. They're or they're, they're hunting dogs or, or you know or invading their dens. And so it's uh, uh, or they're even like uh, like you see the lady with the hat, uh, Elizabeth. She when she was over there, she saw like people wearing these hats. And and actually in Yunnan province of China, there's a it's considered good luck to give a wedding gift of a. Of an article of clothing with a red panda fur on it, and there's also a problem in in captivity with uh, 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 with red pandas. Like over half the cubs born in captivity, they die within the first year. Like 20% of them, like they don't even know why they die. Either they're just they're, they're just still born or they die. Um, uh, the other ones, you know, maybe it's poor maternal care, maternal cannibalism. Maybe they are delicious. Um, or pneumonia, or, or other factors, and so like they really need research into this to, to, to determine what's uh, um, like, like what's happening, and and you know because like, like I said, like they are really unique, like they um, they uh, uh, like they are their own uh, branch, like um, like they're the Alluridae family, and so like to get, give an equivalent of that. Like that's the same. Like they have as much genetic diversity or information as felines, like all felines. So like that's lions and tigers and cats in your house. And so if we if we lose them, that's a lot of information we're losing. But how how the researchers are getting this information to try and uh, um, to address a problem is through uh, nest box cameras. And um, uh, and so, like, they've set up nest boxes, and that's where uh, a red panda lives uh, in the wild as a nest. And so they're, they're trying to mimic that, and they've put all these cameras in there uh, to, to really learn about its, its, uh, its, its first part of life. And, like, this is an example of a nest box. And, like, the information they, they try and get from this is, like, like how do mothers and cubs interact? Um, what happens after a cub is born? And then and also, like, in, in subsequent generations, how... Uh, Lately, do the do the female cubs do they learn something from from the mothers and behavior? Um, and so we see she's uh, making the nest here and checking stuff out, and she's about to give birth. Riveting. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, and and when they're born, they're just uh, they're kind of uh, like oh, there's one, but. And, but it's not just this too. Like there's a there's a side uh, some side information that they're trying to get from this as well. Like uh, um, pandas suffer from a, uh, a parasite, and they don't know how this parasite is getting into captive panda populations. And, and they're also hoping, like by studying this, maybe they can see maybe if there's a, a vector from this. Um, and they're just like little blobs of butter butter after they're born. Oh. And so then you also see how mothers and and cubs interact, and and so like I was saying, the uh, 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 <laughs> just so cute. <laughs> um, so like I said, like like there is a parasite that's affecting them, and um, and and they don't know how this parasite's getting in, and it causes encephalitis. And so, like, if you do a Google search for uh, encephalitis and red panda, you'll see articles like this and like this. And, um, and but, you know, they, they don't call it encephalitis among the researchers. They call it panda cancer. And that really bothers me because I feel like that's just such a cute name. Like, can't we give it, a, like, can't we call it, like, evil cancer or nasty cancer? Or, you know, something that really denotes how horrible it is, like Trump cancer or... <laughs> I'm sorry, I promised no Trump jokes. <sighs> Damn. Um, <laughs> so, so, with regards to the nest box, uh, so they, they, they have these DVRs, they're recording all this video, and this is what Elizabeth really wanted me to, to help with. So they record hundreds and hundreds of hours of video. and. Uh, and but the problem is, is like you know, for every twelve hours uh, they record, maybe there's only a panda on the video for three hours. And so right now, what happens is, is, a, is a human sits down, they watch the video for the twelve hours, or maybe they fast forward a bit, and they have to mark okay for minute, 
you know, 68 to 122, there's a red panda on camera. Then minute 228 to 340, there's red pandas on camera. And like, and this is really, really time consuming for them and like their resources and like these are, you know, these are PhDs and doctoral researchers like putting their time towards like trying to watch a, watch a videos. And you know, time could be better spent like, you know, trying to help uh, red pandas. And so I said, well, I'll figure that out. And uh, you know, just sort of to, to uh, emphasize the problem here, we had these giant videos. They were all between six and 12 hours long. The, and all the videos were huge. They were like one, one plus gigabytes. And, and we also had international people using this. Like Elizabeth works with people in China and actually some in Cincinnati. I guess they're not international. But like people all over the world, like, like oh, I guess the Red Panda community is pretty small and, and uh, tight knit. And so like I thought, okay, how can I solve this? I need to uh, approach this problem. I'm a software engineer. What would a software engineer do? Bam. So, so I guess there wasn't an easy answer, or no one else has done this before. And so uh, I thought, okay, well, how about I just break this down into small pieces? I can do that. This isn't this isn't overwhelming. Like, it seemed really overwhelming. But like, okay, what's the what's the first part? Well, I just need to upload the files onto a server. Okay, I can do that. And I did. I just used paperclip, the paperclip gem, and the jQuery file upload. And um, and the reason those two gems is because they're both easy. I've worked with them before. And the great thing about the jQuery gem is it allows a resuming of uploads. And, and like this, this was very important because, like I said, we had people in China, and so I didn't want someone from China uploading a video that's you know multiple gigabytes, get 90% of the way done, and they lose their connection and start all over because uh, they they pay uh, like some other people pay for pay, pay by the gigabyte. So, and there was one gotcha. I was having a problem with upload size, and I thought it was a paperclip error. It turned out to be Nginx. It comes with a, uh, the default configuration says 20 megabytes. So if you just, if you're ever in this situation, change your upload max file size to zero, and uh, it'll allow unlimited. So now, okay, now we need to identify the pandas on video. I've got the first half done. Second half has got to be just as easy. <laughs> so, and. Uh, but I had no idea how to do this, and so I started asking friends, and, and my good friend Josh, he was the CTO of Uptoro, and as I'm mentioning him, I'm sure they're probably hiring, so go work at Uptoro. Uh, but he said, oh, you need to use a machine learning and a neural network. It's like, I know all those words, but I don't know what any of them mean. And, uh, and so you know, I started to do some research, and like, okay, I, I understand this. But it really turns out that you know, analyzing video is not, not an option. Um, I, uh, I found a couple services that would even do video. You know, the first 30 seconds were fairly cheap, but then after that, it's exponentially expensive. And you know, if they're 12 hours long, it, was, it wasn't, uh, wasn't possible. And again, we're trying to save these researchers money. But it turns out that analyzing pictures with a neural network is extremely easy. And uh, so, okay, all I need to do then is convert a video to images. And, uh, and it turns out like that's all, that's all uh, a video is, is a series of images. And if you ever, uh, as a kid, had one of those books where you flip through it and see the horse running or something. So it's like, okay, I can do this. So how do I convert it? And I found the FFmpeg tool. And so I just you know, put that in and sliced it up. Uh, but first thing, you know, another little gotcha. Uh, most video is like 30 frames per second. And so like turned out to be a lot of images. And I didn't need half a million images. Like, red pandas aren't very fast, and as you saw the baby, they're pretty slow and cumbersome. And so, you know, I just need one every second or so. And, uh, but, you know, I had all the images, awesome. So let's move on to the next step. Let's identify these in images. And so, you know, I'd researched these uh, neural networks things, and there was uh, this library out there called TensorFlow, it's by Google. And uh, I was like, okay, this isn't bad. And they have something called an inception network. and. Uh, it's like, okay, this is really easy, because they had an example using cats and dogs with two different things, and it's like, oh, this is perfect. I can just like steal this entire example, because I just need pandas and no pandas. And, uh, <laughs> and so I just basically stole all their code, and it was perfect. And I had to you know, make my own uh, classifier library of images. And like, the, the images are things like, you know, images when there's no pandas. Images when there are pandas. Oh, <laughs> you know, she's being watched, or she. Um, uh, the, again, there was a gotcha though. Um, 
it, it turns out that uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the researchers in China, their videos were in color, and so uh, that led to some errors. But you know, the great thing is with TensorFlow, you can just rebuild your classification libraries. So you know, just throw in a couple uh, more pictures, oh, little babies, and uh, and then it, it, it was working for them. It was fantastic. And for, for reference, this is what it would look like when you run a picture through. It would give you a probability of, okay, is there a red panda? No, or is it empty? Because those, you know, cats, dogs. And, uh, and so it thinks there's a red panda. And so basically what I did is, okay, if there's, if TensorFlow believes there's more than a 60% 60, 60 chance there's a red panda, throw it into an array, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, but there was a problem with uh, false positives and false negatives. You know, like you're, like occasionally TensorFlow would get some wrong. So I built in a, um, just like a, a basic thing. So I wouldn't start recording yeses or nos unless there were three in a row. And so you know, I'd need three like yeses before I'd say, okay, there's a pen on camera, and then three nos. And then it actually turned out to be really clever that I, uh, clever, lucky. It turned out to be really lucky that I was doing one every second because then it just mapped up perfectly with time. So if the pandas, if the yeses started at position 30, stopped at position 60, I knew from second 30 to second 60, there are red pandas on camera. And you know, the final results of this um, were that it was, it was really, really accurate. I, uh, I, uh, I was really worried at first because when I ran the first video through one that had been classified by one of the humans, I, I got different results. And so it's like, oh crap. And so, but then I, I, I manually went through and it turned out that the humans had misclassified it and the machine was smarter than the humans. Um, and it was cost effective too, like it was just some of my time, but it saved the researchers a lot of money. Like uh, I think they were looking at buying software like this that was in the neighborhood of $20,000 and then software as a service fees each month and all this kind of stuff. And so this is money now that they're gonna use to help baby pandas that hopefully they get to go visit and steal. So, so I don't know if like projects like this are interested are interesting to to all of you, um, and I hope they are. And if they are, I really want to encourage you to come out to Ruby for Good. Uh, woo. Um, and and this is our logo. It's a world. It's full of love because it's embracing Ruby. And if you see in the bottom corner the copyright. That's actually not a copyright, that's a JW. That's our shout out to uh, Jim Warwick, because we love Jim, we miss Jim, and we think he'd uh, approve of what we're doing. But um, you know, to answer what Ruby for Good is, it's easier to ask, answer what it isn't. It's, you know, it's not a bunch of us trying to get together to solve like, uh, stupid theoretical questions like this one, but I guess this one's solved now. <laughs> um, uh, what it is, it's a, it's a long weekend, long event where we get a bunch of people like us together. We, you know, we start on a Thursday, we end on a Sunday, you know, it's all inclusive, so your food and your room, everything's covered. And, and we build software for, for nonprofits, like people who need our, our help, but would never be able to afford us. And so uh, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, that's a hackathon. And uh, it's not, it's really, really not. And anytime someone compares it to a hackathon, my soul dies a little bit. Um, like, we, ours is as much about as much about community and having fun as it is about uh, doing good. Like, we have a hard stop every day uh, at dinner time, and we play games in the evening and werewolf and, and karaoke. Um, and if I could tell you the goals of the event, it's you know obviously to make the world better, and it's to to learn. And we have people who come who are brand new beginners to people from you know GitHub and DigitalOcean and Optoro and. Um, so it's all a range, and, and everyone's gonna learn. It doesn't matter if you are brand new or if you are a senior, like, uh, like, cause the seniors, like, they, they're the people who seem to get the most out of it. Like, a lot of them have never led teams before, or, or, or if they have led teams, a lot of times, like, you know, they, they get stuck in their ways, and, um, uh, so, like, they, you know, they're used to using certain gems and certain tools, and then, you know, they, you know, they learn, uh, like, all these new kind of practices, like, from these people who, uh, are new to our industry, like maybe just out of boot camp and, and familiar. And, and again, community, and like building community is so important, and I think it's especially important right now with uh, kind of like the atmosphere we have in our, uh, our country right now. Um, and so like these are some of the places we've, we've helped in prior years, like the Portland Depper Bank, Snapfresh, Habitat for Humanity, the Humane Society, like just really great places. And like this is the Humane Society team, like what a great looking group of people. And, uh, 
And one of the great, amazing things about the Humane Society is uh, we get to play with kittens. How many Ruby events do you get to go to where there's kittens? And so, you know, again, like there's learning and pair programming and, and like building good stuff. And, and, and again, like community, like we, we're playing board games here and singing karaoke. Um, <laughs> um, actually, again, to hammer it in this community a bit more, because again, I'm in a different mind space because of all the stuff happening. But so Julian there was singing karaoke one, late one night. Uh, with uh, another uh, gentleman named Josh, and Josh is like from uh, Iron Yard, and I guess Josh was looking for a new job, and Julian found that out at like 3.30 in the morning, so he called up his manager at 3.30 in the morning, and said, you have to hire this guy. And now they're coworkers. Um, or this guy, Devin, who's right there. Um, so Devin's another one of those like, like, you know, amazing young men who, you know, you meet this guy, and it's like, wow, he's a... Uh, you know, I'm so happy I've met him now, because in 10 years, this guy's going to be amazing. But he's amazing now, more amazing. <laughs> uh, but so, like, Devin flew in from San Francisco, and uh, well, then when it came time to leave, he didn't get on his plane. He, he stayed in the area. He just loved the community so much. And you know, I guess lastly, Adam. Why did someone get married at Ruby for good? Or propose? Come on. Um, so these are my 75 new best friends from this year. And I hope next year you're one of my um, new 75 best friends. Um, but you know, enough uh, preaching about Ruby for good. Kind of broken record on that, I think. Um, who's ever heard of an animal called an elephant? OK, I see a few hands. Uh, <laughs> so if you've never heard of an elephant, this is an elephant. Uh, elephants are pretty amazing animals. They, uh, they have best friends. They, uh, you know, if one's sad, other, other elephants will comfort them. Uh, but elephants are being poached right now at the rate of about 100 a day. And, um, and actually, this is Elizabeth. Uh, actually, the, the, the person's Elizabeth, the elephant's Ambika. But uh, Elizabeth, that's the researcher. She's also working with uh, researchers in Africa on an elephant project that she needs some help with. So if someone's interested, I'd love to give more information. Um, and she's also working on a behavioral uh, app to track uh, red panda data. Um, and I don't see her here, but Betsy is leading that project. So if you want to get involved in that. Uh, and there's another project as well, so please get in touch. Um, so I know I joke around a lot, but if I can, if I can be serious, I guess for a second. Like I know a lot of us are maybe confused or we're kind of hurting right now because of stuff, and um, you know, like so many people, like choosing hate rather than hope, and and we're you know worried for friends and those of us in uh, maybe vulnerable communities, and so. Um, I know I come out to these events and I give talks on, you know, making the world great and saving the world together, and um, and that's great. And like our community, like we we love to get together and save the world. And I feel like that's something I love about it. But um, uh, I, I do. I want everyone to know that it's okay if you leave here and you just save the world for one person, and it's especially okay if that one person's yourself. So, so I'm not leaving on a downer note. This is a red panda fighting with a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> And they're fighting to a draw, apparently. <laughs> I keep hoping for him to win, but. <laughs> so thank you. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs>